Hello, Pardreamen. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Christina from Circante. I'm here to welcome you to the session. Um, our presenter, Jacob, is here with an amazing presentation that is going to provide you with some great insights and tips so that you feel cool, calm, and collected the next time you launch a Pardot campaign. With that, I am going to turn things over to Jacob. Hi, everybody. So have you ever felt stressed before launching a big uh, mailing or a large automation or integration? Um, that's normal. I don't feel stressed because over the years, I've developed a system of pre-testing and checking up on the things that I do that allows me to feel calm on the actual day of the launch. I'd like to share this approach with you uh, in hopes that it'll help you in your professional lives too. This presentation is for three audiences, specialists who work in Pardot and do the mailings, um, the day-to-day -day work, admins who create more complicated automations and do integrations, and consultants. There will be uh, tips for every one of those groups. So I'm just going to start here. Here's what we'll go over. Uh, we'll go over a checklist for one-off mailings to prevent problems. We'll go over a mental toolkit that I use to uh, foresee issues before they actually happen. Um, I'll share my Excel system for testing complicated workflows and integrations. And we'll also go over some tips for consultants and people who work at agencies uh, about how testing is, is actually a way to make money and enhance client experiences. And finally, we'll talk about what happens if a screw up um, occurs and there's an error and how to handle that. Next, um, before we go into that, why should you listen to anything I say? Well, I started in marketing automation and CRMs at a startup in 2013. Uh, since then, I've implemented um, marketing automation software and have been um, an Eloqua consultant to large enterprises for two years. And for the last five years, I've been uh, the leader of the marketing operations team here at LexisNexis Canada. It's a large um, software company that caters to lawyers. So I've seen a variety of different situations and scenarios and, and this QA and testing. Um, has really been a way of uh, setting myself apart from um, from other professionals. It's kind of like my special sauce. Uh, so first, we'll talk about my checklist for basic um, mailings. And please forgive me. I think that my slides are advancing on their own. Um, so this is for, whoops. Sorry, I'm just going to have to do this a little bit differently. Pardon me. OK, can you see fine now? All right, hopefully it'll work now. Uh, so. Uh, one key to succeeding without errors is to run through a checklist for your regular one-off mailings. Uh, first, I like to uh, double check that you have a subject line uh, and that it's unique if you've copied it from a pre-existing asset. Um, I like to make my subject lines descriptive, just tell people what's inside. And finally, I used um, a framework called RIU. Um, say it. Uh, when you're targeting an audience, make sure that uh, the subject line speaks to them so they know it's relevant. Uh, it speaks about something they care, that they know it's important to them, and also uh, talks about the timeliness of the message. It's something that has to do with Q4 2021, not something 10 years down the road. After we're done with that, um, I like to check lists and um, exclusions. So double check that you have a list of recipients, double check that you have your mandatory exclusion lists. Uh, here in Canada, uh, we have some laws around unsubscribes. So we have a special list that uh, uh, takes out unsubscribes, competitors, and also government clients, because sometimes you have special rules about communicating with government users and clients. And finally, do a gut check. Does the size of the list seem right? If it's a huge list, that's probably your entire audience. Well, maybe something went wrong in the list pool. Next, 
uh, you check your sender and reply to address. Um, the best sender name um, is one that's familiar to your recipients. Uh, make it uh, usually it's best to use the company brand. A lot of times people like to use the sales rep's name, but if this is an unfamiliar person to your recipient, then they will say, oh, this is some spam from a stranger. Uh, so only send email from a sales rep if this person has had a communication before with the sales rep. And next, I also recommend that you uh, have a live reply to address. Now there's a trend of using a no reply address, uh, but I think companies that do that are missing out on a lot. Um, a live reply to mailbox can really save your backside. Um, it's a, an important way to actually alert you to errors and problems with your mailings and workflows because people will reply and say, hey, this is wrong. Um, it's a way that I found out about problems before. Another thing uh, is that people will hit reply when they're ready to buy. So having that live mailbox is a way of getting hot leads in front of your sales team, uh, forwarding them to the right person. When you set up a, a reply to mailbox, I recommend that you just forward the replies from this mailbox to one designated person who's a live person. Um, they can have a set of Outlook or Gmail rules that take out all of the automatic out of office notifications um, and also put uh, these, these emails in their own folder. And finally, it's really tempting to actually use your reply to mailbox to do data hygiene and remove people who are no longer at a company. Um, if you have limited time and energy, I recommend that you don't do that. Just focus on the uh, messages from, from re real actual people who say, you know, I I'm curious about this, or hey, you have a problem with your mailing. Uh, next, uh, I like to double check that the mailing looks okay without images. And um, that means that's because many versions of Outlook uh, have images off by default. And if you put important information embedded in an image, um, people just won't see it. People who are blind won't see it because their screen readers won't be able to read it. And also alt text is handled terribly in Outlook. So even if you put your message in an alt text, uh, people will might still miss it. Um, if you put important text into a graphic, uh, I recommend you also repeat it as plain text inside the email. Here's an example. Uh, here's an event invitation for July 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. That's the event name. It's inside this beautiful image. Without images, this is what the email looks like. The date of the event is nowhere to be found. Um, so this is something that was caught and corrected later uh, because we went through this kind of check. The next thing to check on, on big one-off mailings is to send yourself a copy of uh, the email through Pardot and click on every link. Uh, check that the links go to the correct page and a live page. And then also check if the links have the correct uh, UTM parameters according to uh, your, your use of Google Analytics. Um, here is an example of an actual email. Um, you know, I'm hovering over this link and it's got two sets of UTM campaign parameters. Um, two conflicting different values. So now we can correct this ahead of the mailing just because we've gone through that extra part, extra uh, step of uh, checking all the links manually. Uh, the next thing that I recommend that you do is you use the awesome built-in litmus rendering tool inside Pardot to do a render test of how your email looks in different uh, email clients. You'll find this tool in the in your editor under the testing tab, scroll down to the rendering test area and just press new render. This uh, litmus will give you the previews in, in different email clients. Here are the images. Uh, you can see the big version when, when you're using them. Uh, but this is a lot of email clients to check. Sometimes your email will look bad in, in some exotic email client. Do you really care? Well, here's how you tell. Um, Pardot also has this awesome feature where it shows you the email clients that your recipients are using in the reports for your mailings. It's off in a little tab called email clients. And um, I recommend that you find a particularly large but representative mailing that went out to your database that kind of captures all your different 
audience members, all the different markets. Look at the report for that. And that'll give you an idea of what are the important uh, email clients to check in Litmus. In this example, um, iPhone, Outlook, and Gmail make up significant portions of this business's um, user base. So we have to make sure that, that we check all three of these um, email client families when we're doing render checks. Finally, the rendering tool also has another little tab that says spam analysis. Uh, this is out of the way, but it's pretty useful in that it analyzes the text of the email and the, the HTML of the email to give it to see if you'll trigger any spam filters. And it comes with really useful advice here at the bottom. So if you're doing a particularly large mailing, go take a look at this, this area. Um, in this, this case, it's telling you um, emails. The email is mentioning large sums of money or getting rich. So maybe you might want to rephrase your text to just make sure that you don't trip that kind of alarm. Um, otherwise, this mailing has passed and everything is good to go. So these are one-off tips for one-off mailings. Uh, next, we'll take a look at kind of a mental toolbox that will help you troubleshoot any kind of problems. Um, these are five rules that, that I've built up over my career. And um, uh, the first one is that I recommend is you don't really launch anything on a Friday afternoon or a Friday night. This applies to small mailings and big projects like integrations. Uh, the issue with Friday afternoons is you're probably rushed to finish something by the end of the week to deliver it. Uh, you are likely to make a mistake. If you wait until Monday, it's you're less likely to have an error. Uh, that last finishing touch on a Friday afternoon will probably end up being quite time consuming and will eat up your Friday night with your friends and family. Um, also, once you launch, there is going to be nobody there uh, monitoring your mailboxes on the weekends to catch any, any egregious problems, any reply to mailings that tell you, oh, hey, there's an error here. Uh, and finally, you're probably not gaining much by launching on a Friday night. Not a lot of people are responding um, that, that late in the day to commercial mailings. The next rule is nothing new ever works. This one is ripped off of uh, one of my favorite writers, Jerry Weinberg, who uh, is a late writer uh, and consultant. Um, he wrote a great book called Secrets of Consulting. And um, this rule basically says, anytime you try something new, it's really likely it's gonna fail in some way that you haven't foreseen, whether it's a new system you're using or a new approach to something. So I recommend when doing something new, always have a backup or plan B. If you're launching a new system, keep the old system running in parallel. Don't shut it down just yet. Maybe you'll have to fall back to it. Um, also do a dry run through the new system, through the new process. Uh, with test data just to see where the problems are. Don't assume if a vendor tells you it's going to work, don't assume their word for it. Uh, there might be an unforeseen problem. And finally, tr when you're doing something new, try one new thing at a time. This segues into um, mental tool number three, which is um, when you're trying to do a lot of new things and deliver lots of new things, try to deliver it in steps. Um, if it's a huge mailing you're sending out and you're nervous about it, split it up into parts and monitor how the first few um, mailouts are doing. Um, monitor for bounce messages and any issues that you see. Nobody says you have to do the whole shebang at, at one go. Usually with enough uh, advance notice, you can split up things and you split up the risk. If it's a complex project like an integration, I recommend you split it up into phases. And in each phase, you do one new thing. You deliver it fully, um, fully tested and fully documented so that um, you know this first part is working. And then you can build the next new thing onto a foundation that you know is working. This is known as uh, lean and, and also agile. Um, this is a good way of thinking of delivering things in steps. Um, instead of delivering portions of the project that don't quite make sense individually until the very end, try to deliver something that that uh, is usable um, by stakeholders 
and then keep on building on that so that at each point you're delivering something that's usable. Uh, next mental tool is um, pay extra attention for extra important mailings. You don't have to do a render test for a routine mailing to 100 people. Um, that's overkill, but it makes sense to uh, delve deeper and do some extra checks if it's an important mailing. 100,000 people or maybe 30% of your database go through a couple of extra steps. Or if it's five people, but all five are VIPs and like they're the CEO of your company or some other companies, double check that everything is looking just fine. Um, Another thing is if you're launching a new HTML template for your emails, you got to do some extra testing. It's the first time you're trying it out. Probably something somewhere will break. Um, if you're sending out sensitive information that shouldn't be seen by everybody, also double check your system and approach. And finally, if you're breaking your normal way of doing things, again, that's um, somewhere where you should be paying extra attention. Um, not every routine emailing necessitates that kind of level of attention. So this is a good rule of thumb. My final tip is always try to think of three things that could go wrong with any big system or big automation that you're delivering. Um, usually, if you can't think of three things that can go wrong, you're probably not familiar enough with, with the system or, or don't understand all the different parts of it. Um, it's time to go back to the drawing board and take a learn a little bit more about what could go wrong. Um, I use the following creativity prompts to think about problems before they occur. Uh, think about events that might you, you think might happen some of the time, but what if it happens every single time? What if it happens none of the time? So thinking about extremes, um, if you're con collecting some sort of input, what if it's the biggest possible value? What if it's the smallest possible value? What if it's a blank value? Um, or it's something non-standard, you're expecting a drop down um, uh, list, but it's actually something different from a CSV upload. And uh, what would the system do if things happen in an unusual order? Um, you're relying on a certain um, order of things happening. What if somebody does the middle thing first? Um, can your system handle that? Um, what if a system, the external system that you're relying to, what if it's down? What will your uh, automation do in that case. And finally, if you need a person to be monitoring um, something, what happens over the weekend or over a holiday uh, when there's an extended time when nobody is able to act on, on, on a thing. Um, all of these um, brain teasers are a way of revealing problems uh, that could occur and pre-testing for them before they actually happen. Next, we're going to talk about how to test complicated workflows like integrations and really big uh, engagement studio programs. So this is um, kind of my secret sauce. And this, this has really served me well professionally. And especially this approach for pre-testing uh, has, um, has led to harmonious work with IT, um, IT teams. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of it, we need to talk about um, how do we simulate many different Pardot prospects that we can pass them through many different test scenarios. And the way we do it is with the Gmail plus trick. When you have a Gmail, you can modify your address to your inbox plus anything you want and any email sent to an email with this format is still going to land in your original mailbox. In this screenshot, you can see that even though um, my test account got this message, it still indicates what's the original um, altered address that the message was meant for. In this way, you're, you're generating completely unique email addresses, and you can have an unlimited amount of uh, prospects to test with, each one with its own email address. And I like to number my test scenarios on, um, when I'm testing integrations and to add that into the email address for every prospect. That way I can refer back to the prospect it's related to. So 
Here's an example engagement studio that we'll go through. It's from my own world of legal marketing. Um, in this engagement studio, um, lawyers are filling out a form and they're coming in and they're telling you what kind of firm they're working at. And depending on the firm, we will send them a different email. And um, in this example, a person can be a solo practitioner, uh, just uh, running their own uh, law firm, a firm of two to five lawyers or six to 10 lawyers. All of these will get the uh, small practice email. So there might be different actual values in your field, but they all should get the same email. How do we test that the right people are all getting the, going down the right branch and getting the, the right email? Um, here's another illustration. You know, these are the possible values for a firm type, and these are the emails we expect them to get. And um, we're we're gonna walk through an example of testing them. Our approach is going to be to use a familiar tool, Excel, to set up every prospect scenario, and we will upload those prospects and run them through the engagement studio. Then we will export. Um, or look at the results of the studio and compare to what we expected in our spreadsheet. Here's the format that we'll use. Um, I like to set up the test identifier for every unique test and then create that Gmail address that corresponds to the test. Uh, I might have descriptions here. Then we would define our starting conditions. So firm type value of sole practitioner. We will literally take these values and upload them as a CSV into Pardot. Next, we write down what do we expect to happen? What do we actually intend? Well, we think this person should get email A. Next, we'll have a column for the actual outcome. We will manually go and check in Gmail what kind of email they got. We'll record it here. And the final step is we'll compare our expected outcome to the actual outcome and check if the test passed. Are they equal? Well, no, this test failed. In Excel, it looks like something like this. Uh, we have our test description, email addresses. Here's every possible value for the firm type field. Again, we'll be uploading this into Pardot. Um, you can use a formula to create a Gmail address out of every number. And then we put on our thinking caps and we, we think of those scenarios of what could go wrong. Well, what could happen with, what kind of weird values could we get for firm type? And one of them could be blank, for example, or one of them could be a nonsense value that's, that's um, um, forbidden, but we still have to handle that in our engagement studio. Next, here is what I think, uh, what I intend each uh, of these scenarios to get as, as an email out of our engagement studio. Um, we upload this information, run them through engagement studio, and actually I go and I check and note down which email they, they actually got. And finally, we do a very simple cell equals cell comparison in Excel. If they're not the same, well, this test failed. We need to modify our program. Now we'll look at another example where we take this and make it a little more complicated. In this one, we're gonna email people based on their firm type and their geography, their Canadian province. Again, their Canadian province could be one of these values. And here's an extra branching where they get a different email. To modify your test spreadsheet for, for that kind of testing, you simply add a column here in your starting conditions for province. We fill in the province and then some special cases, again, uh, blanks, irrelevant, invalid values. These will create completely unique prospects and part out that will check every scenario. And notice that I'm using uh, the same firm type uh, for every province. Then I go down to the next firm type. This is very exhaustive. You don't always need this, uh, but sometimes it's very, um, it might be a simple test where you just upload a big list and download a big list and can compare them. In this case, we would be checking manually. Um, so uh, this might take a little bit more work, but you've tested every possible scenario. 
here's our final example. What happens when we don't just send people an email, but we also do something to their record? In this case, we're going to increment their lead score in uh, prospect score in certain cases. Um, here's how the spreadsheet changes. This is the one from before. We add another column to our starting conditions because we might need to upload a lead score of zero. We need to, uh, to, to preset our base level of the test. Then we also note down what's the expected outcome. Well, we think in these cases, this person should get a 30 lead score. And finally, we run these people through Engagement Studio and download their the CSV of their records, and we get their actual score. Sorry, here, we get the actual score and put it here in the actual outcomes. We then compare two different fields to two other different fields. If they're all the same, then the test is passed. There is a bit of a trickier formula to do that in Excel. You use an end condition and you compare two ranges. For it to work, you need to press Control, Shift, and Enter. To enter it is something called an array formula. Then this sheet will work for you. Um, taking this kind of testing further, um, comparing fields is, is an easy way to check if your records are doing what you expected. Another kind of check you can do is export um, prospects out of Pardot and the lists in which they are members. Here is a formula that you can use to, to check if somebody has gone onto the proper lists as part of your automation. Uh, this is just a tip. And then taking it really far, here's an example from an integration where um, where to where customer status was brought in from from uh, actual subscription systems into Pardot. So uh, you see this being set up and described. Here are the Gmail emails. Here, um, here is a baseline setup that we're uh, simulating for for the external system. Here is the new outcome that we'll be working with in the uh, source system. Here is the Pardot old value setup that we're simulating for scenarios with subscribers you know being active and then going uh, and then canceling their account so this is where the, it'll say they're active and this is the expected value after we run our integration so here is where it would say canceled we uploaded this information to the source system and into pardot ran it and then downloaded the resulting data from pardot um, as a CSV, popped it onto this sheet. And then in this final section, we do a comparison of about six different fields um, and checking if they all match up. Uh, and, and the integration behaved in the way that we theoretically planned it out to behave. Moving on, um, we have about um, we have about 12 minutes left. Uh, I'd like to talk about some tips for consultants with uh, quality assurance and testing. When I was a consultant, I used to think of testing, I started off thinking of testing as kind of a nice to have, that's something you do after you do the real work. But uh, as I started working more and more, I've realized that test, test work is, is actual billable hours and it actually adds a lot of value to clients. Um, so here are some tips about thinking about uh, QA work and, and enhancing that kind of ability in your consultancy or ad agency. Um, First, quality assurance help close, helps close the deal. By showing a plan for how you will test the work you'll deliver, you're, telling, you're reducing the client's risks. You're telling them, here is how we actually uh, make sure the project will work out. Because a lot of technology projects, most technology projects end in failure, whether that's a system collapse, whether that's the scope having to be cut back or big delays due to errors. Small consultancies usually don't think about uh, quality assurance because it's for, for larger organizations. But if your consultancy, consultancy does, then that sets you apart from your competitors, makes you stand out. And finally, if you are thinking about how you will test together with the client when you're defining your project, it um, helps get everybody on the same page and, and your work definition actually ends up being more realistic because you took that step. 
Next, uh, quality assurance makes for happy clients. It forces you to think about what could go wrong and, and create a more robust architecture that will live for many years without problems at your client's home. Um, and you get fewer errors, you look better, and um, you've seen lots of spreadsheets, multicolor spreadsheets I showed you with the kinds of testing that I've done before. Um, Testing creates a lot of very visually rich artifacts. Um, it helps you tell a story and it helps you bring to life something that's kind of very cerebral. You know, the, the client may not even understand what you did um, behind the scenes. And this is one way to walk them through. Here's how you've added value. The IT team at the client side will love you because quality assurance is something that they do professionally as, as a regular part of their job. So seeing you think about it. Um, um, really, uh, I found that that it makes the working relationship really, really a happy one and, and a smooth one. And finally, when you document your different tests, when you comment and um, you document the scenarios that you've set up, makes it easy to come back to your integration or to your project later and to enhance it and to retest that your new enhancement didn't break anything that used to work. Um, another big part is quality assurance is billable. You should absolutely build, bill for QA. And it's also a way of bulking out and adding value even to small engagements. So here are some benefit from adding, having an additional quality assurance line item there in your work definition. When you're creating HTML templates, that kind of render testing and double checking that that your templates work in every client, that's QA that should be built and should be specified in your project. Any kind of automation could have a testing component to it. Integrations should absolutely have testing um, as part of delivering it. You don't wanna uh, launch and pray. Um, this is a way of pre-testing uh, in, in a more professional structured way. Uh, you could also have engagements that are purely about testing. So you could, just come in as a consultant and test the in-house team's work or test some other consultant's work. You could have engagement that engagements that are just about creating that spreadsheet and for testing and thinking about problems that could occur. And then you hand it over to the client's team to actually perform the test themselves. So QA can, can be a really uh, a real source of revenue. And here's an example of um, a QA project that I've done. This is a pure QA project. There was, uh, the client had a form that was inconsistently handling data that was entered to it. Our consultancy came in and some other, another consultant created a form that should have been more robust and responsive and consistent in responses, but the client wanted to see some numbers and evidence that the problem is solved. So I was brought in just for testing. The task was to run uh, multi-browser tests, submit a whole lot of information, thousands of records to this form, and then show, um, quantify the improvement in accuracy, show that we've had X failures and, and this is much, much fewer failures than before. This was a 30 hour project. So for a consultant, that's, uh, that's a lot to bill. Like it involved uh, a system called Browser Stack, uh, which allows um, you to program and hook into different virtual browsers and uh, created a script that ran thousands of submissions. And then we, at the end of the test, we checked if all the submitted data uh, in the back end of Eloqua matched up with what was submitted and we delivered that information to the client. What you're seeing here is a screenshot of everything running and, and a simulated form being uh, submitted. And uh, this was a video that we created, again, as a rich visual artifact of the testing to hand to the client and show them this cool thing that we've done. Uh, so again, this helped us build a story around it. I looked at, um, at the records of my buildings for two years as a consultant and uh, searched for anything that any work that involved QA or testing uh, those words in the descriptions. The, so here you see all of my work over those two years. The previously shown project makes up this sliver. Anything with QA um, 
I'm mounted for this many hours, anything with test mounted for this many hours. So I'm overestimating a little bit because I'm including things that uh, had other things uh, besides testing in the description, but testing was part of it. Um, but to give you an idea, 12, about 12.7% 12 of my billings as a consultant was for testing and QA. So this is really an area that you should consider investing in because it can result in uh, significant money for your, your business and for yourself. Okay, we have about five minutes remaining. We're gonna talk about what happens if a screw up still happens. Uh, mistakes will always happen. Um, your quality assurance efforts and documentation actually provides cover that you took care um, to prevent problems. It, it, it covers you for those purposes. Chances are, when a mistake happens, your boss is not out to get you, it's not out for revenge. Your boss wants to see two things, to show that you weren't careless to begin with, and also make sure that the mistake doesn't happen again. To show that you weren't careless, you can show your, your homework, your matrices, matrices for, document, uh, for testing. Um, and then to make sure that the same mistake won't repeat itself, you can add it to your test scenarios for later, for next time. Uh, just like they do in aviation, whenever a problem occurs, you add it to your mental checklist for, for things to look for. Here's my framework for dealing with screw-ups in an organized way. You might be feeling panic, but with um, you know these three steps, it kind of brings you down to back to action, productive action. Size up the current impact of the problem. How many people were impacted? Five or 500,000. Correct the root cause for the future so that the, the future, the problem won't recur in the future. And then look at the people impacted and remediate for the past. Why in this particular order? Because if you don't correct the root cause and, and you don't prevent the problem from reoccurring, um, your, your leaky bucket is going to keep on leaking as you're, you're fixing it. So um, this stops the problem. And, and this then corrects a finite set of you know, problematic contacts. Here is an example um, communication um, to stakeholders uh, in an, a sample scenario. Uh, I would tell our in-house lawyer, okay, out of a mailing of 1,500 students, we also ended up mailing 300 people who previously opted out. The message was non-commercial in nature. In this example, um, your corporate lawyer has everything they need to then do their own risk assessment and take their own steps. Then you step back, you assess the problem, um, you correct the root cause, maybe it's uh, the correction is restricting the uh, values in Pardot to a certain drop down so that people can't uh, mess with it when they're doing CSV uploads. And also you can um, alter your process and your training to do things in a different way. Changing the process and training documentation is a valid way of um, correcting for a technical pro uh, problem, and, and not many people are aware of that. And finally, I would remediate for the uh, correct the previously impacted people. I would correct their status, um, bring it back to the the right value, and then I would send an apology letter if applicable. Now, for apologies, stop and think. Would an apology email make things worse when the screw up happens? Um, sometimes you just want to, it's better to stay silent rather than to call attention to a mistake or email people again because you've over emailed them. Um, and then if it's a big mistake, uh, it should sometimes be a phone call or a letter. Um, big screw ups mean a high touch, really personal apology is needed. Don't try to be funny. Uh, when you make a mistake, it's not, a time for uh, for comedy, uh, just be direct and factual. An effective apology in, involves acknowledging you did something wrong and explaining how you will fix the situation. Those are the most important parts of, of an apology. Um, mistakes can be lucrative. Uh, some of you might ha uh, remember the integration test email number one from HBO Max back in June, on June 17th. An email went out to their subscribers uh, obviously by accident. It generated a lot of online conversation for them and a lot of brand exposure. This tweet from them on the topic got 162,000 likes on Twitter, 2.2 million documents on Google talked about this. So this can be beneficial and a brand builder. Um, 
one tip from this event, keep your test messages bland. Don't get clever with them, just in case somebody from, from the public sees them. And finally, I know that in direct mail, um, mistakes can be lucrative in terms of dollar figures. And I went, uh, I looked for evidence in digital mail and I found uh, some information uh, from a 2016 Unbounced seminar conference where they've actually said that their apology emails get four times the higher click rate than their normal emails. These are actually opportunities to form a more human connection because a screw up is, is a really vulnerable moment. And it's a time to um, to build up your brand and, and uh, show consumers what it looks like when things aren't going all rosy. What is your team about? Uh, and reminding them that there are people behind the screen. So it can be uh, an opportunity in that way. Uh, screw ups are not that bad. Finally, thank you for sharing your time with me. Um, if you apply any of these tips and they make a difference in your life, send me a quick note at jacob at jacobphilip.com, add me on LinkedIn. Um, I did this presentation because I'd like to uh, help people and, and it makes me happy to hear about your stories. And I think Christina will, will thank our sponsors at this point. Yeah, um, thank you, Jacob. That was an amazing session. I know that I learned a lot that I'm gonna apply to my life as a marketer. Um, it does look like we're out of time for Q&A. So if you have questions for, for Jacob, please reach out to him as he indicated here on the slide. And thank you for joining us. A special shout out to our sponsors for their support. Per Dreaming wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. Please visit their booths and learn more about what they do. Um, we have a few great sessions coming up in just a few minutes, including one on lead routing basics for Pardot admins with Marco Strand. Um, otherwise, head over to the agenda. You can see the full list of sessions to come. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Um,